Oh, here we are uh, back on here on Veterans Radio. Yep. And my guest today is Guy Stern. And let me talk tell you a little bit about Guy's uh, background. Uh, during World War II, the United States formed an elite intelligence unit mo of mostly German uh, Jewish academics at Camp Ritchie in Maryland. Their job was to devise ways to break the morale of the SS and the German troops that were captured. These men were also often credited with bringing an early end to the war. And one of those heroes is joining us right now, and that is uh, Guy Stern, who is a distinguished professor emeritus of German literature and cultural history at Wayne State University. He is one of these Ritchie boys, and we're very fortunate today to have him back on Veterans Radio. So Guy, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back once more. It's nice to have you again. Um, as I mentioned when we were talking earlier, that the, the Ritchie boys were this, this, this group of soldiers and so forth that were almost all of them were from Europe at, at one point or another. You mentioned earlier that some of them were also Americans that were fluent in uh, German and other languages. How did you get involved with them? And um, let, me back, uh, let me back up again real quickly. How did you get to America in the, in the first place? Okay, uh, my parents seeing the, the growing restrictions and chicanery against Jews in Germany knew that we had to get out of there. So they got, uh, they intensified their correspondence with a relative uh, of my mother's, her brother, who had been uh, who had been sort of exiled to the United States because he had been sassy to his father, my grandfather, and he was a patriarch. So if there was a rebel in the family, where did you send him to? To America, and I'm sure that some of my listeners. Uh, ancestry also had rebels in them. <laughs> so, but you weren't a rebel in your family, were you? I was not a rebel at that. I didn't think so. Um, when did you arrive in the United States? I arrived uh, in uh, 1937. And you were how old at that time? I was 15 years old. Okay. So we've got you here now, and, and uh, you continued living in the States, and you graduated high school in St. Louis, Missouri. Is that correct? That is correct, and uh, then entered St. Louis University. Okay, and while you were at St. Louis University, the war broke out, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, then again, eventually, we, you know, everybody was declaring war on everybody back and forth, and you decided to go down and enlist. How did that go? Yes, my, the first step was uh, I tried to enroll in uh, naval intelligence, uh, which uh, was trying to recruit people proficient in the language of our enemies, languages of our enemies. And uh, they uh, found me competent but they also deficient in one quality. I was not a native born American. My accent betrayed me. So they said, uh, no, we can't take you because we only take American born um, uh, soldiers. And then, however, the draft came and they apparently uh, were less choosy and let me in. <laughs> But it wasn't the Navy, it was the Army, wasn't it? I beg your pardon? I said it wasn't the uh, Navy this time, it was the Army that grabbed you. It was, an, it was the Army, and uh, that uh, is, it did not go quickly because several committees uh, became involved. One German committee for German Jewelry and another one in the United States uh, of which I did not hear really until I was 90 years old because they uh, uh, did not want to cause any, uh, 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 they did not want to uh, cause any clamor 
because uh, there were many elements in the United States, particularly in the State Department, that were not, uh, they did not want to have a bunch of Jews coming over. Right, yes, and then it brought you over. And then, but, but when you got drafted into the army, you went through your basic training and the next thing you know, you're on your way to some special place. Where was that special place? Yes, uh, I got my basic training at Camp Barkley, Texas, and then was transferred on orders that I could not open immediately, as the lieutenant told me. And But I found out quick enough I was headed for the military intelligence uh, uh, MITC training camp, and uh, uh, that started me on my career as a interrogator and uh, interpreter of German uh, written material or printed material that I was able to get a hold of. Well, I'm, one of the things that I learned about the Ritchie Boys for our listening audience, there's a great documentary out there called The Ritchie Boys. You can find it on YouTube and other places. And a guy was a participant in that along with a number of his other buddies. Uh, it's, it's really a nice, uh, it's a nice way of telling your story. And uh, the training was very uh, intense there at Camp uh, Ritchie. And you were actually, they, they called it, uh, you guys kind of renamed it to Military Institute of Total Confusion. That is correct. <laughs> we had a sense of humor. That is true. So can you tell me a little bit about what your training involved? Yes. Uh, it was every aspect of intelligence work, uh, ranging from the Morse code uh, to uh, uh, reading aerial maps, uh, uh, drawing uh, maps on very limited, uh, uh, confined to limited territory, uh, and uh, learning uh, some of the methods of interrogating, of methods of uh, looking for hints that appeared, say, by some chance, got through the censor in German newspapers, uh, and to be very watchful from in for information that would be of strategic or, or uh, a tactical value to our armed forces. I was eventually put in charge of a uh, uh, of answering uh, all the various inquiries that came from units, uh, from the quartermaster to the uh, to the medics to the artillery who wanted to have certain specified information. And it was our job. Uh, uh, I was in fact then head of the survey section and we gathered all the information we could. And as I found out later by from a, his, an Ameri a, an, a historian of American intelligence, that uh, more than 60% of the valuable information needed for our warfare uh, came from the Ritchie boys. We were decorated as a unit for that. And uh, yes, it, it was a good fight. It was a good fight. Uh, so after, after you were at Camp Ritchie um, and the, you were uh, deployed is the term, and yeah. ended up ended up uh, landing on, on French soil at Normandy three days post the initial invasion. Is that correct? That is uh, that is correct. Three days after, uh, but of course we hadn't established uh, more than a beachhead at that time. So, how would you describe your feelings when you landed on Normandy? Yes. Uh, uh, so the feelings as we were going on a, P a PT boat uh, were in our jeep that we had waterproofed was 
as everybody else, whatever unit you belong to, we, we had fears and anxieties, and so did I. But in my case, two other uh, anxieties came to the fore, and one of them was that as a Jew, if captured, I did not think it would be a rosy future for me in German captivity. And the uh, second private concern I had is that I was squeamish. So if, uh, let's say, my mother cut her hand in, when she was preparing a meal, uh, I had to run out of there because the sight of blood uh, really bothered me. And so I thought that's not a good char a characteristic coming ashore in, uh, on the bloody shores of Normandy. And, uh, but much to my surprise, the moment I set my foot on shore and saw some of the uh, vestiges of, um, of soldiers uh, killed in battle, uh, I, this whole concern went out the window. And you got to you got to work right away, didn't you? You mentioned that as soon as you hit the beach, somebody needed you to turn to uh, interrogate somebody. Uh, that is correct. Uh, as I got ashore, I heard a, vo a familiar voice. One of our um, fellow soldiers who had arrived, an interrogator who had arrived uh, one or two days earlier than me. Uh, shouted at me, hey, Stern, get the heck over here uh, because we have too many prisoners. I'm swamped. I ran over there, and a few minutes later, I was confronted by a German battle-hardened artillery soldier for my first interrogation. Uh, I can only imagine how that felt. I got, I'm, I'm, well, you know, in the military, all your training kicks in, doesn't it? Yes, all the training fell into place. Camp Ritchie had superbly prepared us for what our assignment continued to be for the rest of the war. Okay, well, we're talking here with, with Guy Stern, who was one of the Ritchie boys, and he was sent back to Europe. He's originally from Germany, and he was sent back during World War II to act as an interrogator for captured German POWs. So my question, I guess, is how, how long did you, how long did it take you to get across France or, you know, in, back into Germany? This June of 1944, when did you finally get to Germany? Well, I can pinpoint that, but uh, any history book can tell us how we advanced uh, through the Battle of Falaise Argentan in France, how we uh, uh, went on through uh, Belgium, uh, finally got to Germany, and uh, that must have been... Uh, Maybe you, I, I can't specify, but it was quickly. It wasn't quickly. Uh, so uh, it was, and then we ended, were in the setback by the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the German counterattack. Uh, also, uh, we had to retreat after that uh, temporary defeat until our air force prevented before by bad weather uh, could help us and uh, mash the German advances. Yeah, and then you ended up back in Germany. There is one, uh, one story that you are well known uh, for, and that is your pretending to be a Russian commissar. And can you tell me how that came about and why, why would the Germans be afraid of you? Uh, yes, that exactly was, uh, was the uh, premise that we could scare them 
in, a, in, in a interrogation, which otherwise uh, they uh, would see right through uh, that we were trying to get vital information for the Air Force on landmarks for targets, on the movement of, uh, say, one factory to another place where we needed to locate it, or uh, the Air Force asked, uh, we are not quite sure whether we knocked out this factory completely. Uh, can you get some uh, inside information from a prisoner? So that all uh, fell into place. And uh, I, I think uh, the only real obstacle we had is when we used our various deceptive devices to get information uh, on ordinary uh, questions that we asked. We could get, disguise the questions so that the Germans would still uh, would be tricked into answer, giving away, away uh, valuable information. On the other hand, when we asked of the, about stuff for the Air Force, uh, a, an assignment that fell to my friend Fred Howard, uh, then the Germans could write through, see through it, because why would you ask for landmarks to an ap optic a factory or whether uh, a factory had rail connections to the main uh, uh, system of railroads, of uh, tracks, and you knew, they knew immediately we asked that for the purpose of bombing them. So they, are, they refused answering until we found a method of scaring them into answering. And that was that we had known through the war that the Germans uh, were deathly afraid of being confined in a Russian pre-W camp because there were memories that they had of having been rather brutal while attacking the Soviet Union. And so uh, we found a way to exploit that fear. I, uh, after several, we discussed all sorts of possibilities, and then I disguised myself as a Russian commissar. And uh, my uh, tent was, uh, uh, was uh, in identified as that of Commissar Krukov, liaison officer. That sign was in three languages. And inside the tent where Fred brought every reluctant prisoner, uh, there was a picture uh, autographed to uh, Commissar Krukov by comrade uh, Stalin and some of them saw that. Uh, so they really believed, or many believed, in fact, most uh, believed that we were able uh, to get ra a Russian there and that he would take them and ship them to the salt mines in Russia. And uh, that scared them, or many of them, sufficiently to give us even the information about Air Force targets, about landmarks, and the like. Well, you had, you had to disguise yourself as this uh, Russian commissar. And uh, the, the story of how you came up with your accent, I found, is interesting. How did you do that? Yes, that was... A, uh, my uh, first of all, my my I exchanged my GI uniform for those purposes uh, by a, a Russian uniform parts that came up in a phantasmagoric uniform, uh, and we exchanged that with Russian prisoners uh, or liberated prisoners who uh, 
uh, got in exchange some of our discard clothes, and I put medals around that uniform that we took away uh, from, um, mem uh, from memorabilia that the Germans had hunted down and now had brought as trophies to <laughs> with them. And uh, so I was a medal behung soldier uh, for the Russian cause. <laughs> And uh, then the accent about which you asked, uh, that was a, a curious coincidence. Every Sunday, my aunt and uncle and I, and their son and his son and his occasionally daughter, listened to a radio program uh, by Eddie Cantor, and he had a, he had a um, minor role for one of his actors who played the mad Russian. And he had found a way of suggesting a Russian accent in his English. I did the same, imitating him and put it into my German when interrogating uh, the hapless German who came to my attention. I am sure that you scared them witless let's put it that way <laughs> yes I would. And I, the moment they came into my tent uh, i uh, uh, was absolutely uh, ch charging with anger at the particular prisoner for any reason that i could find and that scared them even more and that's a new was a uh, way we broke those prisoners frequently as well. Not all of them, but. Well, well I, I, I wanted to point out to our audience that you mentioned that the, the Ritchie boys always adhered to the Geneva Convention. You never touched a prisoner, never hit one or anything along those lines. Yes, we, we did not touch. That was one of the first items of training at Camp Ritchie. We have a convention, as they said, we have a treaty among nations called the Geneva Convention, that you can use pressure, but no ever corporal, corporeal uh, touching them or uh, doing physical violence. Okay. And, and it, it, it's nice to know that we had, that at least we adhered to that most of the time. I think that's important. Um, when you were at, at, in Germany and, and the war finally ended, were you able to go back to your hometown? Yes, uh, I got special permission from my superior officer to go my, in my, to my hometown in the north of Germany. And the reason uh, he had to get clearance for that, uh, uh, northern Germany or big parts of it were under British occupation. And so he got uh, permission from the commandant in my particular city. And so if a buddy of mine and I, he had also relatives in Northern Germany, uh, we could uh, drive to Hildesheim uh, and uh, thereby uh, I could go there and make inquiries about my parents. Who, who, unfortunately, who unfortunately were lost in the Holocaust. That is correct. That's correct. And that's, that's kind of the, the um, transition I wanted to go to is that the remainder of our program today is going to be about the Holocaust Memorial here in Michigan. And I know that you were involved in it. And I wanted you to tell our audience a little bit why that particular organization is so important to you. Uh, it is important to, uh, to me uh, because uh, I admire the people who actually survived the camps, even the designated death camps, uh, and I admired them. And I thought if I did any civic voluntary service, I could help. And the... Uh, 
Rabbi, our founding rabbi, Rabbi Rosenzweig, uh, asked me uh, to, uh, yes, he could use me first as liaison to uh, universities. I com Coming out of the war, uh, I uh, continued my uh, my education, and he then I got into various roles uh, at his early, unfortunately, early death. Uh, I was uh, uh, put in as temporary director of the Holocaust Museum. I've served in various capacities. Uh, currently, I have uh, been assigned a very satisfying piece of work, and that is the so uh, uh, the um, so-called Institute of the Righteous, which uh, put differently is both the spread of altruism, the service to uh, others whom or to strangers uh, as an ideal and implanted in high schools as a worthwhile cause. And secondly, to find out what prompts people to do this heroic and dangerous service, helping the suppressed in despite orders from the uh, Nazi powers. And I know that you're involved with the educational program that you mentioned now. Uh, when we talked before about uh, putting the Holocaust into the curriculum in all of Michigan's public schools. Yes, I, I said that not about myself so much, no, not at all in, at the moment, but rather uh, we were given a very important assignment, we meaning the, Holo the staff of the Holocaust Museum, because uh, uh, about a, a year or nine months ago, uh, Mich uh, the law was passed that Holocaust education became compulsory in Michigan high schools, and so we needed. Uh, so Michigan needed new staff or staff proficient in other disciplines, but had to acquire the, in dish, the additional skill of uh, being proficient in teaching Holocaust history and uh, service. So that keeps me still uh, connected and employed by the Holocaust Museum. It also... Uh, keeps me in, keeps my wife and me in bagels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, and uh, so I'm still an employee at a fairly advanced age of a highly respected organization. Well, you certainly are. And uh, Guy Stern, I want to thank you very much for your patience and for being on Veterans Radio again uh, today. And I want to make sure that you and your wife stay safe and take care of yourselves. I mean, you're only 99 years young. Uh, there's plenty more to go, right? <laughs> That's highly optimistic. <laughs> but uh, what I still want to say is that the Holocaust Museum is open again and has shouldered that additional responsibility beyond uh, being uh, showing our exhibits and thereby, uh, or as a help meet of for informing the public what happened in the Holocaust. Uh, we have a website and uh, the um, uh, anybody who wants to contact us and bring anybody with him or herself, uh, that is important, taking parts in our rounds of, uh, uh, lead, uh, of, uh, of leadership by our docents uh, who take the people through the museum, inform them, and we are 
only too happy uh, to uh, service that purpose uh, and uh, uh, just call us and I'll be happy to help anybody who came as a result of your fine program. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Guy, again. And uh, we've been talking with Guy Stern of the Holocaust Museum in, here in Michigan and also his history and his story with the Ritchie Boys, uh, German immigrants who ended up going back to Germany during World War II to act as interrogators. Again, I encourage you to go uh, to watch their documentary on the Ritchie Boys. There's also a number of books out there about the Ritchie Boys. I think you'll find them to be great great stories about great men and women uh, in the service of their country. So Guy, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be in touch again, hopefully in the near future. Thank you for having me.